Frederick Kampfer. Wow, why why would I put Frederick Kampfer in here? Um, my dad, I think, um, gave me a lot of my my uh, vision on how to look at things, um, and so I, I have to talk a little bit about about his background and where he came from. Um, <clears throat> He was uh, uh, born in 38 or er, 25 in Vienna. Uh, he was a Holocaust survivor. Um, when he was in Vienna, his experience, well, let me go back. Um, I think a lot of, lot of what he experienced there is how I see the world um, and how I also appreciate all the beauty right in front of me. Okay, some of what, which he did not get. Um, just a, a little background. So in Vienna, as a 13-year-old boy, being Jewish, um, he was very restricted. The, um, he was not allowed to go certain places. They had to wear their armband. Uh, they had to get permits to travel, permits to work, permits to go just about anywhere. It was a terrible way to grow up as a 13-year-old. Occasionally, uh, the police would come and he would have to run downstairs and he had a, a neighbor that he would hide under, um, under his table, uh, a tailor who was not Jewish, and he hid under his table until it was safe and the police left. One example of, of what he had to deal with on a daily basis, he was coming back from school and his friend, the, he walked by the neighborhood butcher shop who, who was his friend and there was a crowd out front. And this was just a little corner uh, butcher shop. They had the little tiles and he didn't know what the problem was. And he sort of uh, worked his way to the front and he saw that they had actually uh, torn his, this man's clothes off and had him scrubbing the swastika off his uh, storefront on his hands and knees off the, the tile. So this is what my dad saw. Um, they left as soon as they could. They escaped from, from uh, Austria. On a long journey, they went through um, Germany to Belgium. They walked over to Belgium. They got into Brussels. And then when, when the Germans were invading Belgium, they actually um, had a visa to come to the United States, but they had to get that and they had to leave Belgium right away. So they managed with 3,500 people, 3,500 Belgium Jews, um, to get to the French border. Well, as soon as they got to the French border, the French put them on boxcars in the middle of summer and shipped them down to a um, containment camp. I found this book that lists all these different names um, who were in the camp. The camp was uh, in Perpignan in Southern France. It wasn't, um, it wasn't until he passed away that I actually knew any of this. Um, he was always a very positive type guy. He taught psychology, he had faith in humankind. And, um, and in fact, he, he taught back in Germany in later years to give the new generation a better view of things. Um, we found this diary that my mom gave me. Um, and it started in German, and then he taught himself at 13, he taught himself French, so it went through French, and then it ended in English, and he was very exacting about this, is from, from the time he was in Vienna, this diary goes through all the way till he came to the United States, and one of the things that really um, struck me most of all is I'll just read a little passage that he said. He said, uh, I am very content. This is now he's in the United States. I'm very content. I can sleep and spend the whole day in school. I'm in the US, the only country with real freedom. Free, free, free. I have that underlined. No force, no secrets. Remember, he had to, he had to deal with all this growing up. Nothing to conceal the possibility of activity in every field, a real democracy. The first impressions about school were uh, the teachers were swell. School is excellent. So 
I realized after reading all this that how his emotions and his experience colored the world as I see it. And so that that um, is an important um, part of, of my background, they, that optimism that we have that freedom to do things. So, um, so I look at like everything we have around and I, I, it amplifies my appreciation of what we actually have. And I know that anything is possible. So when I started my business, I, I could start a business, first of all. Um, how, do you get, how do you get clients? I actually knocked on doors, went door to door and said, I had my little portfolio of my mom and dad, and I showed them that. And for $4.95 back in the day, you would get a sitting and an eight by 10. Um, I feel like I could photograph what I like. I could travel without permits, unencumbered, um, showing what, what I see as the beauty around me. I could do books and calendars um, and give presentations like this. So, um, so that, that background, I think, is, is pretty important in to uh, see my, how my career went and, and what I'm about. But there was another big influence on my life and career. Ta-da! And it was the School of Architecture at U of I. Um, let's see. Um, so there were, this is just some of what I, I did. I, now, I was not in the structures option, and I kind of shudder to think of if I had gone through structures, how many buildings would fail, but, but that's a whole other thing. Um, I love the design end of things. and. Um, but I received great training and uh, a continuing connection with, with some of my friends, but uh, Benji Bross, Dave Chasco, Jeff Foss, Catherine Anthony, et cetera. Uh, so I still have that connection with the school. Um, but some of my training um, what what I saw most valuable for me is being analytical. So I look at something, look at the, the, the landscape, you know, the Midwest landscape. Why, why is it so beautiful? Well, and, and some people may not think that, but why is it so beautiful? And then um, I, I feel obliged to figure out why it is um, using both sides of the brain, the analytical and the emotional. Maybe look at different perspectives, look at um, uh, different viewing positions of things. Um, and this, this all goes toward my photography and, and putting my, my um, art in two dimensions. Um, everything I started looking at, I started thinking in terms of design, even if it's logistics design, any, everything, design became part of my life. Um, and I love the process, the process from concept to finish. So um, when, I, when I do my work, I kind of think of the concept is, do I want to take a photograph of this sunset or do I really, you know, is this, is there some greater concept um, um, that, that I need to articulate before making this piece of art? Um, I have the tools through tools to convey the idea in two dimensions. That was technical tools. And um, even the balance of analytical and uh, emotional helped me build a, a, a business. And my business was photography at the time, weddings, portraits. Um, and I, like I said, I went door to door. I put myself through school then, but, but it was four and a half years. Well, I was on the four and a half year program. So I'm not sure where that other semester came from, but there I was. So mid-January, I had to decide what should I do? So I decided, why don't I go ice fishing and think about it in the North Woods? And I took a week and, and, it, and I just middle of right, right about now it would have been in january and um decided well what can i do 
what what path do you think I chose? So this is uh, this is this is what I chose: landscape photography, and I love it. Um, and so I've developed. Um, I did portraits, as I said, um, for for years, and people would look at my photographs on on the wall that I took the landscapes, um, and they started buying them. Well, I, I just did the landscapes because I, it was a creative outlet for me. There wasn't, it, it was a, not even a spec. It was, it was um, I was just doing that because I wanted to do that art and people would start buying them. So I developed these different um, <clears throat> portfolios uh, and that led into a couple other things. And now I've got these books and calendars. I do the postcards. Uh, in original artwork, and you can see in my background is is the um, my gallery on South Neal. And when I think about my career, I think about what is what is really my passion. And what I really love to do is capture the essence of a place. Now we moved around a little bit when I was younger, and I talk about that, but. I love seeing different places and trying to figure out what it is about that place that people love, what makes it special. Um, and then the serendipity of discovering uh, those secrets. There's nothing, nothing better than, than that, that's, that serendipitous experience. If, for example, in, in 3D, you walk down a street, a, a narrow street in Europe, say, and you turn a corner and, and there is some big square. That, that serendipity is wonderful. Um, when we're younger, when we're young, we, we always love the light at the end of the tunnel because we don't know what's at the end of the tunnel. Unfortunately, as we get older, we know more. So we know what's at the end of the tunnel and it takes a little bit of the fun away from it. But so it's a little harder to have that, that serendipitous, that great experience. But, but this is what, I think we can we can um, nurture if we think about it. So I loved I love doing that, trying to figure out uh, these secrets and and get that um, serendipitous experience. And then I have to put it in two dimensions. And um, I found that uh, being an outsider, and this is what I, I love to look at things from an outside point of view with a fresh and open mind. And there's, there's so much that you don't see after you, you've seen it all over and over again. So that's kind of my passion now, how, you know, um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that, but decades later, I, I just wanna um, uh, say that the training, the colleagues, inspiration and friends uh, that I am glad to, to be able to say thank you to the school. So let's go into my, my photography, this, oh, I think I have it, my first photograph. Um, it was a magical photograph. I, um, I was in fifth grade and I didn't really know what we were doing, but they said, we're gonna do a contact print. Whatever you have in your pocket or items we could put on the print. So I had it, my hand and my, my comb. And the light turned on for a few seconds, and then we put that in the developer bath. And it was absolutely amazing. This, this 3D stuff came out on, on a two-dimension piece of paper. And I was just, I was just odd. It was, it was a surprise. And I, I saw photography as a tool from that day on. And I'm still looking for that magic for that serendipity. So a uh, little more background. I grew up in Portland, Oregon, where there are tall mountains, deep valleys. There are a lot of edges. And I think people love edges because you don't really know what's beyond. You can dream. And that would be being at the edge of the ocean or on the edge of a cliff in the mountains. At the, you know, the edge of people love to be at the edges. And you, you can think about that. 
easily when you have mountains and cliffs and oceans. Um, but it's a little, little harder to think about that for a flat landscape. Anyway, we moved. When I was about 13, 14, we moved to the Midwest. It was the midsummer, the corn was 10 feet tall. We took a train back from Portland. So it went from, um, you know, this beautiful valley that was all green. Uh, we went up through the mountains and then we came out on the, on the desert on the other side uh, and then the Rockies and then it just got flatter and flatter and flatter and flatter. And, you know, the, the rail bed was, you know, five feet above so that sitting on a train, I could see corn, 10 foot tall corn for miles and miles and miles and miles. In fact, I didn't think anyone lived here. There was, how could anyone live here? There was just corn. Occasionally I would see, a, a, you know, there'd be a, a grain elevator. But it was, it was really odd. But I, I, I found out that people did live here and their joy in living here a few years later after going through a few, a few seasons. And um, I think we, and we live on a line. So our, our joy is on this, this flat line. It's, a, it's not the physical contrast. And I, see, I... I think our when you're when you're at an edge or you're in the um, mountains, you know the some of the it's the physical contrasts that are so beautiful. You can you can get a pathway that goes up and down, and that's what I think gives people joy. It's a little harder here because we don't have that. So what is it that we have? Um, well, I would say we have a different kind of Beauty, and, I'll, and we'll talk about that. So we live on this line. Here's a, a photograph that I love um, where it has work, play, the school bus, um, everything on that one line. Um, so in order to figure out what it is that we have that's, um, that's so wonderful, we have, to, we have to know about life cycles and the history of the people. Here we have generations of people working the land, working together, um, doing things that, that you know, there, people talk about a, a work ethic, Midwest work ethic. Well, if you've got uh, corn that you need to harvest and it's dry, and if you have corn that's brought to the elevator with a higher moisture content, you get less money, what would you rather do? You'd rather get the, the corn to the elevator before the rain. So there's no, there's no way, there's no excuses you can make to not harvest when the time comes, you've got a rainstorm coming and people work, you know, they'll work late into the night to just get that last field harvested. So there's this work ethic, I think that's ingrained in, in here in the Midwest. It's important to, to know what some of these, um, uh, some of these, um, things on the landscape are, you know, this, I didn't know what this was for a long time. Apparently all the fields around here, because it was a, it was a, a marsh, are, are drained. They have drain tiles. These are just large drain tiles, but I didn't know that for a while. Um, but that helps in, in me doing my work to understand what, what happens with these drain tiles. They dig them, they put them underground. Um, all these fields have drain tiles. And so that gives you a clue on how to, how to look at the landscape. Even here, for years, I looked at um, uh, rectangle hail bays, um, bales of hay. And I, I didn't think anything of it, obviously. I mean, I didn't grow up on a farm. I, you know, I just took it face value and then they started getting round. And I was like, why is that? Um, and when it comes down to it, one person could actually do a hay bale with a spindle machine and it's, it's more mechanized. 
And that's why things change. That's why the landscape changed. So that I think that's really important to be able to read the landscape and understand um, the, the connection that the people have with the landscape and, and how it affects things. But also the earth cycles are important. Uh, and I'm going to I'm going to go over a whole year in photographs of what I see is the beauty of of uh, this area. We start off, and and it's not this year. In fact, today we had our I guess we had our January thaw, but um, we're going back into cold tomorrow. But um, so generally in in winter you've got this embossed this this white on white landscape where you have kind of embossed you could just see a little bit of the um, the form and it might be punctuated by a tree or a grain elevator or a crib and then mid-january i'm gonna say like today you get the very first hint of spring now, we didn't probably get quite that hint, but let's say it got to 45 degrees. You know, that's that's almost barbecue weather. I mean, it, it it's so exciting and there's so much energy um, and you can see, you could start to see the black soil. And then when all the snow's gone, everything's kind of waiting, waiting for the harvest. It's the soil gets blacker because it's wet. And so it's, it's much blacker. And then, um, then you start to get some some turbulence in the sky. Now, uh, I'm sure some of you have been on campus in spring when you get a south wind, and and the first thing you might think is, "Wow, the South Farms are really strong." Well, knowing that the South Farm smell comes through, you kind of get a sense that well, that this is a warm front, and look to the northwest, and you might see. A cold front coming through, and I think that's empowering to to start um, to have that um, benefit of of, of um, having seen several cycles, and to know when when the south smart south farms start smelling, you know it's going to get warm for a while, and then it's it's uh, going to be a turbulent sky. This was um, this was one really exciting image. I, I um, went to West Virginia on a photo trip and I went several days and didn't really get anything exciting. The minute yeah, I, yeah, I was, was back in um, Illinois near Paris, all of a sudden I had this, there was this beautiful, beautiful sunset. So um, and then when everything gets ready, the farmers get their tractors, everything ready, and then the landscape changes. The fields are all groomed. The, the, you can see the horizon line, and then they turn green, and there's patterns. There's beautiful patterns uh, by the, um, from the corn and beans. It's lush. There's Larry but working it, on it doesn't take very long until we hit an inflection point in the middle of summer with 10 foot tall corn, everything gets hot and steamy and heavy and the um, bugs are making sounds and everything just kind of stops. And then if you look really close, you can see some of the corn is turning red little bit red, just starting to turn brown. And this might be in August. And so it everything's getting ready for the harvest. And then pretty soon you see the tractors, the combines going back and forth. And the horizon line changes from what was not visible to a large to be able to see miles and miles and miles. After that, Everything is just waiting for the snow to return. And the magic returns with the snow. And it becomes a white and white landscape again. And I just, I love that chronology 
of this landscape. And, and to me, that's, we have that, and that's the beauty of, of our landscape, whereas people tend to think of vertical contrasts, but we have chronological contrasts that are so beautiful. But it's not just that. It's, I think there are certain moments where if you know a little bit about the people and the landscape, and if you know about the, the natural elements, there are moments when you can capture some of these things. And here are some examples. This was an image actually where I thought there might be some storms, but there was nothing around. And I left the car and walked about 20 minutes to get this photograph. And literally in five minutes, this big cloud comes along. And I just had time to capture it before I had to run back to the car before I got drenched. Um, but there are just these moments that are um, so beautiful that this is um, this is an image that I, I I had been photographing a wedding and I was exhausted and I was driving back on 49 near Muhammad and I decided to turn off. It was a nice sunset and when I turned off my my headlights hit the stop sign and it and I thought this was a great composition with the moon uh, entitled Stop Moon Crossing. Well, it turns out that a gallery in New York decided to uh, purchase this image and made a poster. And back in the day, they they had catalogs before being online, and they had a little a little tiny version of it in their catalog. And someone thought that there was dust up in the top left, even though it was named Stop Moon Crossing, and they um, retouched the little moon out, which was very frustrating. But um, this is this is full circle. This is one of the one of my favorite. Um, um, intersections of, of lifestyles, earth style, earth cycles, and moments that that I have because I understood that we had that we had um, um, harvest going on. This was in northern, uh, far north Illinois. I knew there was harvest going on. I knew a cold front had come by, and there there might be some fog. Uh, but you know, who's to say how much? So. I got there at like early morning, just before sunrise, and the moment was perfect. The sun, just as the sun came up, the fog started to burn off. And um, anyway, that that's a favorite image. So really, um, in my mind, capturing the spirit of the prairie is, or, or showing where the magnificent lies is, magnificence lies is an intersection of the life cycles, cycles earth cycles. And moments, and it's that intersection that I find is my best work um, for the prairie scapes. And having lived here for a while, you know, over time, even the extraordinarily beautiful can become ordinary. And you don't even see it, you don't even know that it, it exists. So, for example, this is University Avenue in Prospect in Champaign. It's a one-way street. People drive uh, east, and it may, it's, it's a reasonably nice street, but if you look west, it's, that is even more exciting. But, you know, you have to kind of look at things differently, and that's, that's what I've tried to do through all my work. Um, so, I'm photographing all this stuff, and I love the sky. I love the, the the fields and the barns. And I did this for a number of years. And after a while, I began to think of this as I was just photographing superficially the 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 top levels of everything. What about people and their stories? So I began to think about this, and and wouldn't you know it, the U of I Press came to me, and they had published a couple of my books. They asked me to do a, a photography book, uh, architecture and photography book about barns. And, you know, I, I didn't want to just do a picture book of the barns because there's a whole lot more meaning to barns than just the structure. Um, 
there's an emotional connection. People, let's say, if you grow up in a city, if you've grown up in Chicago, um, I feel so, I feel you might still be nostalgic about Barnes. And why is that? Why why would you be nostalgic about Barnes? You know, you go to Lincoln Park Zoo and they have, or near the zoo, Lincoln Park, they have a a, a farm and people just love Barnes and they talk about Barnes and um, there's a connection there. And so I wanted to um, do this collection, not just of the images, but the stories behind it. So um, with my wife, Elena, we started to do this book. And the first thing we did was sent out an email. Uh, we got amazing, overwhelming response from people we were looking for stories. We sent out an email for the stories. And, and I, I actually wanted to get a um, story of Lincoln, Abe Lincoln slept here kind of barn, but we didn't get that. But anyway, we got so many other stories, amazing stories. We got them through phone, fax, mail, email, um, lots and lots of referrals. And, and there were hundreds of stories and we mapped them all out as you see here um, throughout Illinois. Uh, so I went went out and I tried to photograph all these places around Illinois and a couple couple of the stories I, I'll share with you here. Um, this was the Paulsons. Um, they're up near Rockford and you can still see their barn if you drive up, what is it, 90, 90 I believe, going north to Madison. It's, it's just the, you look to the right just past, um, the last Rockford ex exit and their barn is still there. Um, they were waiting for me. They had told me their story. They were waiting for me at the barn. I went in and, and this was exciting. It's like, you go in, you turn left. And again, I have not, I was not brought up with barns and stuff. It's like, this is like the, looking for the light at the end of the tunnel. I went down this narrow hallway um, and there was something to the right, the stairs, and it was the sequence was so exciting going up there. And then I turned, and then Walu, there was this huge, and that's huge, um, auditorium up above. Maybe not so big, but it was this discovery that was so exciting. And, and if you look closer, closer, you see that um, there's a, a uh, platform there. And it turns out the story was. They, um, the barn, they had a barn that burned down and their, their neighbors helped build the barn, uh, build a new barn. And at, to thank them, they gave a uh, barn dance. And it was so successful that they did one every, every Saturday night, 25 cents for guys and 15 cents for girls. And um, this was like a big thing in Rockford. So I looked around and um, saw vestiges of, of of those barn dances, just to see the story. And I came across this here. Um, I don't know if you could, can you see that? The writing. Um, and this writing was a memo from Evelyn Rock. And it says, who she danced with, Hamilton, Price, Paulson, Charles, and then it went through the nine dance partners. And the last entry is, went home with him. So th this, is, this is the excitement, you know, and the serendipity of finding these stories all behind these doors. Uh, I'll share one more story with, of the Barnes. This is in Elmwood, Illinois. And this, this is just an entry to the barn. And, but imagine, here's the barn. Imagine being in the grass and kind of crouching down the grass, grass and fearing for your life. And why would that be Look, looking at the barn? Well, in the top of the barn, there was a, if, if this cross was lit, that indicated that as a, as a signal station on the Underground Railroad, that it was safe to pass. So it gives this whole thing more meaning. So we did the, we did the barn book. And um, as I said, 
I've always tried to kind of look at things from different perspectives. Um, at this point, traveling far away helped refresh my perspective. So I went to China to get something totally different. This is the fish market. These, these fish were actually flopping around and live. And when you, when you pick one, they kill it right there. And it's fresh, let's, let's call it just fresh fish. Um, amazing street vendors. Um, this was Forbidden City. There's, there is beauty there. One of the problems is, so I took a cab and the, the cab driver was smoking and it was so bad I rolled the window down and it was worse outside. So one of the things I think of Beijing more than anything is that it was terrible smog. Then I went to a different country with about a billion 300 people, 300,000 people, and that was India. And before I, I left, I, I talked to a number of my Indian friends um, about what is it really about your land, your, your country that you really love? And um, almost everyone said the color. And a lot of people said the smiles. So with this immense poverty, there were, I found smiles. And I certainly found color, and it wasn't the landscape. Everything was, was so colorful. This was a little, I, I believe it was a family. We couldn't communicate very well. Um, but I was in, a, in the car and um, they were going somewhere and a couple of the ladies wanted to get a free ride. And uh, he did not want that to happen. It's kind of interesting story. At New Delhi's train station on a Friday night, everything in the world, happens there, everything. It's jam-packed. And I was on the platform on the other side and a train comes in and this guy gets off the train with his spear. And it's like, he's so colorful and uh, I wanna get a picture. So he started going up the stairs and I started going up the stairs and uh, I couldn't quite get the picture. So when he got to the top, I tapped him on the shoulder I, I showed, you know, sign language, picture, picture. And, and he was delighted to, to pose for me. And he, he opened his robe and there, there were swords and knives and all sorts of stuff. Uh, but he was so excited um, for me to, to do his portrait. So with my, um, my work, uh, I've kind of have this evolution of my focus first. Um, I love defining the beauty of a place. Um, and that then on the superficial level of um, you know, the landscape, not going any deeper than that. Um, and I found that that here we have chronological beauty, which is pretty much the same as as you know, you go to the mountains and it's a physical beauty. Um, but I then looked beyond the superficial and I looked at the stories, the stories of the barns, um, all these other, you know, other stories. And then um, I think the next thing is celebrating people and their connection with each other. Um, and, and so this is my, my newest thing. And this, I started a couple years before COVID. I started this project. This is, this will be my new book. Um, and it's a little, it was a little tough, so it's been on hold a little. Um, but one of the thing is things that I've noticed, and and you know, our kids, and uh, it's a generational kind of thing. People today don't spend as much time looking at each other, talking to each other. You don't, you miss the body language. It's, there's so much technical uh, texting, and and so we're we're kind of missing out on all that. These are not my photographs, but. Um, this illustrates my point. You don't even really talk to people when you purchase stuff, um, which is 
I think unfortunate because I, I think a lot of the conflict in the world is because people don't connect with other people. It's easier to say something in, in text than to someone's face and you, you don't work it out. So, so this is an issue and how can I show um, the beauty of, of being with other people? Um, this, this probably typifies what, this is up in Rantoul, a photograph I took. Um, uh, there's no interaction. You know, when I went to the barbershop when I was younger, uh, you talk to the barber, this is, this is typically what, what the problem is. Um, so I think we all crave the human touch um, so we can be part of something. And instead of far off places to get that different um, fresh perspective, um, maybe travel the heart of people. This is what I've tried to do is go more to the gathering places and where people get together and, and have the beauty of, of interaction with other human beings. So some of my photographs for this book are, are these. This is a school bus in Mansfield, rock, paper, scissors. Little town of Moonshine, Illinois. There's a whole story about Moonshine. Um, save that for another time. Dancing, parades, the joy of, of celebrating together. One of my first images for this collection was in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And this was an actual barbershop. I didn't set anyone up. Um, I changed the colors a little bit, but I didn't add or subtract anything. And it turns out there's, uh, it looks like that's John Wayne on the, on the television. And here are these guys sitting at the, on Saturday waiting for a, a haircut. And we still do live on this line, but it's just a little different line here on the beach. This is in Lincoln Park in Chicago. In Sydney, the Sydney Parade. In China. And just the joy of going, going to the grocery store when you were little with your parents and seeing what kind of surprises you can get. The Sydney Dairy Barn, um, if you ever go there on opening day, you'll find the line goes all the way out to the street and beyond. It's amazing, but it's like the whole community comes out and there's such joy there. On a very, very hot day, I was driving back from a trip out west, stopped in Springfield, Illinois, and I got out of the car and I saw these guys sitting there and I went into the 7-Eleven or whatever it was. I was like, oh gosh, I need to photograph this. And no, I don't have the guts to do it. So I walked back to the car and just as I was getting in, I was like, no, I'm gonna do it. So I got my courage up, I asked them and they were so excited to pose for me. They signed releases and everything. And uh, it was, you know, they were cooling off. Um, so I'm still working on this where people gather and, and to try and promote and, and reveal the joy of being together face to face. And I think even now with COVID, when we, when we get back to seeing each other face to face, and I wish I could do this lecture in person, um, I think we'll, um, we'll be even more excited about it than three years ago about being with other people. So that all led to my newest pro project and that's embracing the people of Savoy and working on Savoy and their sense of place. A lot of you may think of Savoy as the road from Champaign to the airport or to Walmart. It's much, much more than that. So we're working on that. Um, so I just wanna say, you know, I, I, I see the magnificence every day. I think I tend to look at that because of my, some of my background, my dad's um, uh, way of looking at things. Um, it's, it has to be an optimistic um, look. You have, to, you have to have an optimistic bent on this. 
I consider different perspectives. And the thing is, if you stop and think about what it is that's so beautiful, I think that it's a, it, it um, heightens that sense of beauty. But the main thing is that that beauty is all around us. We just have to see it. We have to look, think about it, and see it.